Hi everyone, in case you are still living under a rock, I've set up a Twitter account uh, on which I'll be publicizing my video updates, but more importantly, to get people together to play Octagon. On Octagon, rather. So do follow me, the link is in the video description if you haven't done so yet. Today I'll be playing a semi competitive deck. It's a typical nerve hub with the Astro Train, but I'll be using my influence instead of biotic labels or scotch turfs, I'll be using them on lots of money. Turtle bags, pet campaigns. This is to exploit the relative lack of counters on the runner side to horizontal play. Uh, short of playing Wizard or Valencia Scrubber, there's very little you can do to control asset spam, which will allow the corp to gain large amount of money to use on mid season psychographics. That's the game plan. Will that actually pan out for me? I don't know. It would be tough to say. Um, I'm playing this in Nerf Hub because I'll get lots of card draw, which means I can spam assets better. Uh, I would prefer the Harpsichord's uh, defensive ability, but the fact that I get extra card draw and the 2 extra influence uh, tilts the balance in any H's favour. This is a very odd hand. It's almost always a keep. But against Haley, I feel this hand is too slow. It doesn't have Astro Scripts for early scoring. It doesn't have money assets to get out of hand quickly. Against Haley, you know they won't want to run early on, so you really want to put the pressure early on by scoring an early Astro. And hey there, early Astro! Um, I would like that, but first, install new remote to draw a card, and then um, I sub R&D to give the impression that I'm st strong in HQ, which, which isn't the case. I do not. The last thing I want him to want to see him do is to run my HQ and grab the Astro. Because I do plan to score the Astro next turn. So, nail biting? Okay. That's good. He hits the Eli. I, I'm safe. That is the best card he could have hit. Or maybe the Info Overload. Because I needed both the Wraparound and the Astro to get the train going. So, that's immediately going my remote. Although, um, the extra draw let netted me a project view, which I didn't really want to see. Not much I can do about that. But I'll keep him out of my remote. Seeing he only has 3 credits at this point, I know the only way he's going to get into this server is if he plays Inti, which is very unlikely, or if his Cerberus, um, yeah, if he clicks for credit and then plays Cerberus, which is also very unlikely. So I took a gamble there and it paid off. I was able to get a turn 2 remote uncontested, which allows for a turn 3 Astro score, which is very, very helpful. Whether he runs Clot or not, doesn't matter. Um, the very fact that I can get an Astro script off is a huge deal. Unfortunately, my man draw was another view. Well, crap. That's why you see in chat that I wasn't too happy about this. Even though I got 2 points, there is a very strong potential for an opponent to get 4 points if he gets uh, good with his random accesses and he nails one view and comes in to run again. Usually, th uh, this is a very bad uh, trade for Haley. Because Haley herself is not getting any, uh, is not moving forward in terms of setting up. She's not getting extra credits from Desperado, not nor getting data sucker tokens, and most importantly, she only has one credit, which means that if she accesses an NAPD, she can't steal it. A lot of problems, which is why I'm not, I don't fancy him running HQ so often. But it paid off for him right there because he could potentially get four gender points with the easy to steal bills due to my unlucky draws. He did get 2 out of 4 points, which is still relatively decent and puts him still in the game. Um, he's now tied with me on agenda points, and yes, he can still contest me. Unfortunately for him, or rather I should say her, um, she still has too few credits to contest my remote. That wraparound is causing so many problems, and for me, it basically allows me to score 4 free points. So this is really what you need to do as um, uh, near hub again, or any corp for that matter against a fast or rather a slow, a big rig runner. If you don't play fast, you will end up in a situation where the uh, Haley can easily R and D lock you to oblivion. The architect on R and D cannot be res, and he top decks an astro off it, which is very unfortunate for me. But again, I deserved it because I did not play enough econ, so I didn't regulate my tempo. And as such, even though I did manage to score four points. I lead 4 points as well, and this is going to bite me very hard, because 2 more agendas and he wins. That's not very good. Thankfully I have a cyberdex in the remote, he won't suspect too much about it, but this will be very key for neutering threats such as imp counters and obviously the clot. So at this point I'm just clicking for credits, in case he runs R&D again, I'm going to dump the architect on him. 
if I can find an architect, I will be able to accelerate my gameplay a lot. Um, finding a pair campaign on Turtle Backs can give me a lot of money. And at this point, I realize he's playing Cash, so that's the Cash Aesop's and Econ engine going there. And with Haley's ability, he's going to be able to trigger it for maximum effectiveness alongside Technical Writer. This is a pretty good combo. Technical Writer costs zero to install, and it's a resource. So basically, you can chain, for example, two Technical Writers in the same turn, or maybe a Technical Writer and Aesop's. With all these cheap resources and the, his her ability to speed install hardware and programs, he was able to liberate seven credits of the technical writer in a very timely fashion. So now he actually has credits, which means I cannot continue pumping agendas out under the wraparound. At the same time, I do not want to draw any attention to the cyberdex in there. The last thing I want him to do is to run in, trash it, and leave me with no cyberdex to counter clock. So I'm not going to install anything in the remote. Um, I'm not going to bother baiting out his barrier breaker, I'm just going to continuously install stuff, hopefully find agendas to score on my sense sensitivity grid, which I just installed. He plays Poco London Library, which is very interesting. I wonder what he's up to. Can you guess what he's up to? He has an LDS processor, a cache, and a Sahasrara. Goodness, this is next level jank. In any case, he's still setting up, so I better get um, my agenda's going, I don't find any, but I do find a pack campaign which changed into another pack campaign and I have a third pack campaign, so that's where all my pack campaigns have been. I really could have used them earlier on because he would never contest them and I would gain so much more money. But instead, now I'm fueling his astrolabe, which is single handedly the best counter against my horizontal spam. Probably not a good idea to fuel his card draw. Doesn't matter anyway because he now has Proco, so he's gonna get efficient card draw regardless. But still, who do you think is at an advantage at this point? It's probably me. I'm still at an advantage because I do have a Cyberdex lying around, I do have a Sensor lying around, my RD is not locked, and I have an Astro counter. There are a lot of factors going for me, and my opponent is still in deep trouble because the moment I top deck another Astro or Bill off my deck or breaking news, you bet I'm going to score it. And there's nothing my opponent can do about it, other than to raid my R&D. And if he attempts to do so, I have a mid-seasons following, uh, which will be followed up by information overload, both of which are very nasty in combination. So yes, I'm at advantage, but now he finally gets his breakers going. You can see the chameleons there. The flying chameleons are out in force, and they can easily wreck face on my, um, on my ice. So that's something I need to worry about. As I said, I top deck the view, I'm going to score it. So apparently he doesn't run clot because he doesn't bring one out, so I'm going to score the view, putting me at 6 points, match point with Astro Token and Sen Sen. Yes, my opponent is in a lot of trouble, but on the same token, he does have the capability to R&D lock me. He has the capability to um, do anything he wants this turn. He has free, complete free reign, and this is where I can really suffer. I do have an NAPD in the heap, which I probably should not have tossed. I tossed it earlier because I didn't think I was going to score it. Turns out it's going to be a mistake. He does get an RNDI and sees two cards, none of which are agendas. This is both good and bad. It's bad because I'm not going to top deck an agenda of RND. I could use Jackson here, but I prefer not to. Again, that's a, that's a mistake. I should be using Jackson to uh, unlock RND, so to speak. Big mistakes there. Um, yes, I definitely should, should sex Jackson at this point. Instead, I'm con I continuously draw, I fuel his draw, and I'm not drawing past the R&D lock, because at this point, I need an agenda, not more money. I have more than enough money to score any agenda at this point, because with two pack campaigns, I can fast advance anything on the sand sand. I need to see an agenda. If I had fast track, I probably would have won the game already, but I don't. So, yes, this is a big misplay because now he has the full potential to completely RD lock me. With the Fem on London Library, I'm in trouble. I'm in a lot of trouble. He's going to bypass my architect. I can afford to res it, but it's only going to tax him for two credits. Do I do that? It's tough to tell. Um. While installing Fem, he uses Haley's ability to uh, install a chameleon. As uh, it doesn't matter what subtype he chooses for the chameleon at this point, he's just installing it for fun. Um, 
Or more importantly, he, install he is installing it because he doesn't want to discard it at the end of his turn. Because the Chameleon bounces back to his hand after the discard phase, if I'm not wrong. So, I rest the Architect here, forcing him to pay 2 credits which brings him below NAPD steal range. That's the main motivation. And show that he doesn't steal NAPD, but he does find a breaking news and now he's at match point. Slowly but surely, I'm losing the grip on this game. And I really should be using Jackson here to um, unlock the top of R&D. But I obstinately refuse, because I don't know why. I really, 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 really should be using the Jackson. Even if I'm not sacking Jackson, I should be double drawing with Jackson every single turn, just to make sure that I have an agenda in hand to score the next turn. So here I finally decide to do it, no agendas. That's not looking good. Um, yeah. So I just click for credits at this point, which is a mistake again. I should be double drawing with Jackson until I find an agenda. So very terrible moves there. At this point I was just thinking of further icing up R&D to protect myself. But against his rig, I should be more than conscious of the fact that that is not possible. Because he can easily bring a chameleon, a sentry chameleon and a barrier chameleon and get through my wraparound architect server. There's nothing I can do about it. There really isn't. So he's just going to fam the architect again and make another R&D run to lock my R&D, which is the absolutely correct thing to do. This is exactly what you need to do against an NBN that is about to win, on the verge of pulling off a victory. And he finds the final Astro for the game. So instead of doing the standard post-mortem on the game, I'll de I'm deciding to um, talk about Asset Econ in Net Netrunner instead. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Asset Econ is actually pretty well placed now as compared to Operation Based Econ because, uh, it, yeah, uh, especially in this deck because your assets uh, snowball because of turtle bags and they protect themselves pretty well. And it also gives you more draw with near, hub, near Earth Hub's ability. But picking the right assets to play in this deck is quite crucial. I am spending influence on Asset Econ and I better be spending them on the right ones. So let's do a comparison. The thing is, it's not very easy to directly compare assets with each other due to the many parameters inherent in each of the assets, a lot of which cannot be captured in a single graph. I'm just taking two of the more important factors here, which is money, the amount of pay, uh, money an asset pays out, and its defense, which is basically its trash cost. Uh, high defense is good because it means that it makes your R&D less porous and it makes the assets less susceptible to trashing from your remotes because your remotes tend to be unguarded because you're running very low ice in this deck. Money is the amount, obviously, um, how much the uh, asset pays out. Now obviously, infinite assets such as pet campaign and mental health clinic will have infinite payout, whereas finite assets like Adonis and Astro Bar will pay less because, well, basically Adonis can only pay you 8 credits at most, for example. So we are not looking at the best possible payout but the average payout which you know is roughly about 8 turns I mean that's just a very rough estimate some games can last really long some games end in a jiffy but in any in most cases you won't expect your pair campaign to pay more than about 8 ticks roughly I mean that's roughly half the length of an average game I would say so um, pair campaign is kind of the it's kind of the it kind of sets the standard in a way because it is neutral and it has a very vanilla in fact basically just gain one credit every turn it's very very vanilla turtlebacks competes with that in the same domain it's almost the same i i find it quite hard to quantify turtlebacks against pack campaign because they both have different triggers but generally turtlebacks pays slightly more than pet campaign because with near hub's draw you are, you can actually get quite a lot of assets and upgrades and you can even use your extra ice to install on new remotes just to trigger turtle bags and it really uh, cascades down especially when multiple turtle bags active so this is why i think turtle bags edges pet campaign just by a bit but it does cause one influence which is something to take note of otherwise they're exactly equal in stats two to res four to trash um, on the very defensive side, we have marked accounts, which I don't play in this deck because it's too slow. It pays. I place its payout lower than that of pet campaign, even though they both pay at one credit per per turn. 
The reason being that you need clicks to load up marked accounts and that significantly detracts from your tempo because you could be using those clicks to click for credits instead. So at even at the baseline, marked accounts is going to pay less than a pack campaign will. The only upside is that you lose less if the runner decides to trash it, which is another factor to take into account, which is not reflected in this graph. The fact that the runner can trash your assets with money or even better with scrubber, wizard or imp. Uh, marked accounts is better in that sense because you lose less money from the asset res. Mental health clinic is actually not as good as I initially thought. Of course, there are some the upsides such as making your sweet sweets better, but in general, mental health is actually not that good. Not only uh, is it more susceptible to trashing, it also costs two whopping influence, which is a big problem. This means that it's actually on the same influence uh, axis as Adonis campaign. So if I'm think if I have two spare influence and I'm looking to spend it on an asset econ, do I go for mental health or Adonis? And it is then that I realize that Adonis is actually the better option, because it is. I will eventually find it, uh, myself having too much ice, and what better um, server to put an ice over than an Adonis campaign? Indeed, there are not that many things I want to protect in remotes, and Adonis is one of those key things. So, for the three trash costs, I think Adonis provides a lot more bang for its buck. I know that mental health will pay off more in the long run, but the burst econ that Adonis gives is cannot be underestimated simply because um, you want to activate at mid-seasons. You want to put your opponent on mid-seasons range as quickly as possible. Adonis allows you to do just that. Whereas mental health is very slow and gives the opponent one extra hand size which doesn't really help matters. So yes, um, I did realize by making this graph that I should be playing Adonis instead. And that is why there are no mental health in my deck. I'm using Adonis instead. And looking at uh, the two highest cards in, on this graph, being the purple cards, Eve and Adonis, it's no surprise that HP has the strongest econ engine, reliable econ engine of all four court factions now. Because their campaigns just pay out so much money, it's ridiculous. And they are fairly self protecting as well because they are relatively high trash costs. The big downside of the high res cost is usually mitigated by the fact that HP runs lots of ice and is able to tax the runner sufficiently by the time they get to the assets. So this is why HP is in a very good position right now and this is what contributed to uh, the strong showing of food codes at Worlds. It is noticeably weaker when you port these um, assets into NBN which doesn't run that much ice to protect the assets but it's still very strong economy. The fact that you can take 2 to 3 credits off them at the start of each turn cannot be underestimated. This is what makes what sets Sundew and these campaigns apart from the rest. Um, 2 to 3 free credits per click uh, for, per turn is ridiculous. So yes, that is Asset Econ in a nutshell. I can talk a lot more about this, but in general, what I'm really looking to uh, use are those in this region. Basically, um, to the right of this, which means that they are fairly defensible on themselves. You don't need too high a trash cost. I mean, having 5 trash costs is gravy, but usually 3 to 4 is enough to deter most runners from trashing. And something that actually pays out decently. The payout is actually more important. Something like Astro Bar just pays way too poorly to be good. This is not a spark deck anyway, so it wouldn't help that much. And even marked accounts I feel is too slow. For this deck, you really want to go faster. I would play Sundew in this deck if it didn't cost so much influence and it didn't uh, have the restriction of not paying out if the runner runs it. Similarly, Eve campaign actually fits in very well with this deck, but again, it costs too much influence. And of course, it has the rest cost downside. The assets here are all suitable, very suitable for playing in this deck, and Adonis seems to be a cut above the rest. Too bad it costs too influence, so I think I can only include one copy of it. But otherwise, Econ is pretty solid. There's a good mix of Burst Econ in Sweet Swing and Hedge Fund and these Asset Econ. It's just that I didn't manage to see it this game. Well, that's all I have. Thanks for watching. Happy Net Running.